Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, in our ongoing study in Church Dogmatics by Emil Brunner, uh, published in German in 1946. We're going to take a look at Chapter 2, Anthropology. We're going to kick off Chapter 2. And uh, the actual title is going to be the title to Block 3 for this lesson, Image of God as Dialectical Relationship. And it is absolutely the best presentation of this doctrine I've ever seen. It's a tremendous uh, lesson, pages 46 to 56. And uh, remember, uh, we discussed it in the previous lesson, but for Brunner, the doctrine of creation includes Genesis chapter 1, but it doesn't begin with Genesis chapter 1. The doctrine of creation begins with the Gospel of John chapter 1, and then after the Gospel of John, then it goes to Genesis for Bart, Brunner, Moltmann, and Ponenberg. The doctrine of creation begins with the Gospel of John chapter 1. And for me, that is true, and I think it is for every believer that uh, we all, I mean, if we admit it, we all love the prologue to the Gospel of John. We, we, well, there's no other way to say it. We love the prologue to the Gospel of John. It's a poetic, powerful section of Scripture that, uh, well, it's simply amazing, but... Uh, the doctrine of creation gets rewritten in the prologue to the Gospel of John. And Bart, Brunner, Moltmann, and Ponenberg begin the doctrine of creation with chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. And it holds true with anthropology as well, so keep that in mind. Block 1, anthropology. How do we interpret the story of Adam? Brunner begins with 1 Corinthians 2.4. Paul speaks of words of man's wisdom. Paul previously had a self-knowledge of natural man, not affected by revelation. This is Saul. A secular anthropology, which differs significantly from Christian anthropology. We negate Neoplatonic rationalism, we negate liberalism, we affirm Christian anthropology. We negate entirely liberalism. Remember, neo-orthodoxy began as a protest against liberalism. Remember, Bart uh, opposed liberalism. That's how the commentary to Romans was written in the first place as a protest against liberalism. Sin binds the intellect from revelatory truth, which is the truth in Christ, the truth of Christ. We discover that truth dialectically in the event of conversion. Conversion is an event. So anthropology, Bruner says, must be discovered dialectically. And uh, just to, I'll repeat this. I think I said it before, but, you know, some people say, well, what's dialectics? I don't understand dialectics. And the easy, the easiest explanation is think of dialogue. Think of a conversation with another person. There's your best picture. When you have a conversation with another person, you say something, they listen, they respond, you listen to the response, and then you respond again. It's an exchange, back and forth, back and forth. That's dialectics. That is a dialectical relationship. It's a dialogue, an exchange, back and forth. So that's the best way to understand dialectical theology. It's this uh, exchange, back and forth, between the... Uh, um, opposite poles of a paradox. 
God is transcendent, but God is also with us. Remember, it's a back and forth between transcendence and agape, transcendence and agape, back and forth, back and forth. That's the most fundamental dialectic that there is that uh, Bart uh, began with. So anthropology is discovered dialectically in the event of conversion. So block one, note three, Augustine affirmed creation as image of God, and he affirmed rebellion against divine destiny as sin. The Adam in paradise had two essential aspects, continuity with the history of Israel and simultaneity, a simultaneous relationship with the creation of the cosmos. Now, Brunner says, we don't have to disregard this. We don't have to change this. We can still think in Capernaum terms uh, as uh, those who have modern science as our context without giving up the story of Adam. We do not give up the story of Adam. It doesn't mean negating our current scientific context. We can still hold fast to Capernaum science and still posit the story of Adam. So keep that in mind. Let's go on to block two. And uh, this is critical, defining the self as a spiritual being. You and I are spirit. I said it in the last lesson, but we currently live in this body of flesh and blood and bone, and it is a schoolhouse. It's a place of learning, and we are to learn absolute dependence on our Creator. We are to learn to uh, look toward our Creator, to affirm the existence of our Creator, and to not ignore our Creator, the greatest sin of all, ignoring God, the greatest sin of all. So we're here to learn absolute dependence on our Father in heaven. That's the way Christ said to say it. He said, say uh, our Father. So that's why we are here. We are housed in this current body of flesh and bone and blood, but it is a place of learning. We are spirit. Our starting point, and here you go again, creation begins with a New Testament witness in John's Gospel. We begin with Christ, the Word incarnate. We ask, what does Christ teach us about anthropology? So, Again, anthropology is a Christological doctrine. We discover ourselves as creatures in encounter with the Creator God. We also discover our distinction from the rest of creation. We discover self as subject by being in encounter with God as subject. This leads us to the awareness of self as spiritual being. When we live in Christ, when we encounter Christ, we discover that we are essentially spiritual being. We are spirit. God is spirit. We are spirit. We recognize in the encounter with Christ that we are a self as spiritual being. Therefore, Two, three, conclusion, self as a spiritual being. We encounter the God who reveals himself. We discover God's claim upon our whole being, including body and spirit. Our life is derived from God. We have been created in the image of God. 
we have been created in the image of God. And that leads us to the very powerful block three that uh, it has a wow factor to it, okay? <laughs> That's what I'm going to tell you. It has a wow factor to it. This is tremendous teaching by the Holy Spirit through Professor Emil Brunner. Let's go to block three and take a look. Image of God as a dialectical relationship. Image of God. Creation always begins with the New Testament. Creation always begins with the Gospel of John, with Christ as center, where God imparts himself to us and claims us through this revelatory event. Image of God is a revelatory event, revealing our relation to God, calling for our free response to God. And I love what Bruner says here, and our response is an echo of agape. Isn't that a great term? Our response is an echo of agape. Because our response is always spirit-empowered, it's an echo of agape. It's a reflection of doxa glory. Our nature is a creation by God. 3.3. Three, three, image of God as created by God. God wills to impart himself, toward which we respond in love. And this is a dialectic as spiritual act. Image of God as a dialectic of spiritual act. We correspond to the divine word, to the rhema, the spoken word. Remember, Christ is the Lagos and the rhema. Gospel of John, chapter 6, uh, John calls Christ the rhema, the spoken word. And this creates our free selfhood. As what? As an I-thou relationship. The I of the self in relation to the thou of God. Bart firmly, this is where Bruner got this, by the way. Emil Bruner was uh, the first disciple of uh, Bart. But uh, the I-thou relationship, the I of the self in a dialectical relationship with the thou of God. This defines, now catch this, our posited self-determination. Now, this is non-Hegelian positing of the self. And I want to pause just for a minute here because I want you to understand this. I've spent year after year after year studying Hegel's philosophy. And I have a tremendous appreciation for Hegel's philosophy. I think he's the greatest philosopher who ever lived. And he is the one who began dialectical thinking. And Hegel was an idealist. He, had, uh, he developed that idea of the realm of positing. And that was a tremendous offer from the realm of philosophy, this realm of positing as a reality. And uh, people have a great deal of difficulty understanding Hegel. And uh, I was no different. It has taken me years and years and years to get a full grasp of Hegelian philosophy. It didn't happen in one year. It took a lot of study. But now I do have a very good grasp of Hegelian philosophy, and I appreciate Hegel. But I'll tell you now, although we're going to talk about the realm of positing, and the realm of positing is that area between subjectivity and object objectivity. It is uh, that area where we make up that uh, filter of a worldview through which we view all of reality, through which we act. We make up a sign model worldview, a Christian worldview. And that Christian worldview is what we posit. It's what we put forth. It's the filter through which we have our being through which we live. 
And it isn't just an ideal idea. It isn't Hegelian realm of positing. And that's what Brunner's saying here in 3.5, non-Hegelian positing of the self. The self is posited unto God within the real existing kingdom of God. This is not Hegelian idealism. This is positing of real responsibility. We live dialectically within this living Lagos. Or as Paul said over 600 times in his letters, we live in Christos. We define our image of God through the dialectical relationship of living in Christ, in Christos. And that is an absolutely beautiful way to conclude this lesson. Paul used that expression. That's his favorite sign, by the way. Paul's favorite sign is en Christos. He used it over 600 times in his letters. And I'm going to close right there. That's going to wrap up uh, 46 to 56. Our next lesson will be Anthropology, uh, part 2, 61 to 71, pages 61 to 71 next time. And like I said, to me, this lesson has a wow factor. That block 3 was tremendous. The best presentation on the doctrine of the image of God I've ever studied. So thank you all. And uh, that concludes the beginning of Anthropology pages 46 to 56.